Good morning, Steve Stice, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dolph Simons Family Studio, and delighted to be back with you here on this beautiful, crisp fall morning. Wow, I walked outside, there was some frost mm -hmm. on the ground, some frost on things, and uh, man, it did kind of feel good. I thought it felt good. Oh, Could you see your breath? There. I could see my breath and people <laughs> wear your mask. I know that's a hard message. You've never heard that from us before. Broadcasting live with Amanda Gartner, our Director of Quality and Safety and Infection and Prevention and Control and all things COVID, really. She is here to help lend her expertise. She is a terrific uh, person here in our health system. Delighted to have her with us here in the studio. And, of course, Hawkeye. Hi. How it's Friday. <laughs> it's Friday. I hear you are here early. I early. was up early. You didn't shave today again. That's like three times this week. What? No, I, <laughs> it doesn't. I don't really need to shave daily. I, it's hard for me to uh -huh. to grow a beard. So. Okay, there you go. All right. Would so that how be are we a doing Don Johnson look if we yeah. were back in the 80s? You are dating yourself when you say Don Johnson. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, nobody else here will know who the heck you're talking. There's about. TV Land. Maybe somebody. <laughs> so maybe still watches the reruns. Or Glenn Gulia from The Wedding Singer. No, okay. No. Enough of this, people. All right. <laughs> Julia Gulia. Okay. So numbers, not too bad. I'm hoping we don't get any higher, um, but currently in the hospital, 26 active patients. Uh, 11 of those are in the ICU, unfortunately, eight on the ventilator, and unfortunately, one on ECMO. And for those of you who don't know, ECMO is um, a really last ditch effort to really try and save your life. Um, it just involves um, you know, lots of uh, intense, large lines to help uh, exchange your gases through your blood essentially so it's a very it's a very last step it's usually when people have pretty severe trouble from a breathing, breathing standpoint yep. the ventilator we're worried is having to work so hard it's doing damage to your lungs so we try to rest your lung let your lung heal a little bit and yeah. use an ex essentially it's kind of like an external lung to try and get um, oxygen and carbon dioxide yeah. out and and you can do that for a while but at some point your lungs have to heal so. yeah similar yep. to hemodialysis but for gas exchange essentially uh, we haven't really had one here before we've had a couple people who um, we, we considered but really this is our first one so again 11 in the ICU and a high majority of those on the ventilator eight on the ventilator so in Hayes they still have high numbers as well still 16 active patients uh, sorry uh, 14 of those active infections and two of those in that recovery period we still have 35 patients in that recovery status as well so all right, so Jill, are there questions out there from media? Yeah, I have some that were texted to me uh, okay. earlier this morning. Uh, I'm going to start with Channel 9 and Brian Johnson. And he said that um, the community, they, you know, on their social media and that kind of thing, is saying that there, if, if a person who has COVID-19 doesn't wear a mask and is near a person with a mask, the person with the mask has an 80% success rate of protecting the individual. Um, and then they say if they're both wearing it, then it's a 90%. And he goes, are there percentage rates around masking? All right, percentage of masking, Amanda, what do you think? I have actually looked for that statistic mm -hmm. and have not been able mm -hmm. to find it. I think there's um, plenty of infographics that show the risk mm -hmm. spectrum of low risk, medium risk, high risk, and the highest risk, really high risk. If, everyone, or if no one's wearing a mask. Um, but I have looked for those statistics and haven't seen them um, specifically published. And I think it's probably going to be a hard statistic to find um, with a lot of um, like certainty. Yeah, I think that's probably right. And I think it's a hard, it's a hard research area even to really conduct yeah. in because there's so many questions you have to ask yourself, like what's the actual viral amount that, yeah. you that you're spreading at the time. Uh, let's just say this, wear a mask. That's how you stay safe, wear a mask. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. And then he just yeah. had some follow-ups. If you would just talk to um, cloth mask versus other kinds of mask, mm -hmm. just briefly, it's kind of recapping. All right, Amanda. So I think um, the key component is that we wear the mask from a source control perspective, so keeping the droplets yeah. to ourselves. Um, in the community, we know that um, the the double layer um, cloth masks are really um, sufficient. Um, in a healthcare setting, we understand that um, a surgical mask is recommended, and if you're um, dealing with a population where we're doing aerosol generating procedures, then we would recommend um, a respirator, which is a different kind of mask. Um, but in general, uh, the population, a cloth mask is, is effective. And really, yeah. everyone just should be wearing one from a source control. If you happen to walk across a group or a person who doesn't have a mask, then just keep your distance. Mm -hmm. 
And I think the other thing is we see those neck gaiters, but we know that it has to be a certain kind of neck gaiter to work, Dana. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We know, I think the, the best part that you said was we established that wearing a mask is for barrier protection for you in case you are sick and spreading um, the virus into the environment. Uh, I think we've really landed on really any two to three layer cotton mask is going to be good. We know that um, also in a lot of places, I was in Costco yesterday, a lot of stores now have boxes of surgical type masks. Um, we don't necessarily use those in the healthcare setting. We need to make sure they're validated and vetted, but those are just as good as well. And certainly nothing provides as much protection as an N95, a properly fitted N95 mask. We have to um, fit test those for patients, uh, for healthcare workers in the hospital. Um, the other masks don't provide as much protection as the N95 mask, but again, we need to make sure that it is a barrier. So it's a barrier for the wearer, However, there is the added benefit that um, if you are in uh, contact with somebody or in close proximity, you as the wearer could be protected as well. But we really want that, um, that barrier effect of the mask. I think the Swiss cheese model, that David Wilde has, mm -hmm. uh, he's the one that I think showed that uh, the other day, and it's, it's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool graphic. And what it says is each one of the things we do are really important to staying safe. The family on the far right, there's Corona over there on the far left, or how I'm looking at it anyway. The first thing is socially distancing. If you're not that, then you've got to have a mask. If you're not going to have a mask, make sure you're wearing your hands, and then eventually rapid testing. And those four things can really keep us safe, but it's like Swiss cheese, and you can get a hole punched in any one of those. And, Gosh, what we know, and it is the information has mm -hmm. become just clear, that when people wear masks, they can stay safe. And you look at the counties and the cities right now in the Midwest where this is exploding and where the bed capacity is stretched and people aren't doing as well, it's all in areas where the masking culture is not as strong. And then you turn and let's talk about Douglas County and the city of Lawrence and the University of Kansas. Mm -hmm. 25,000 kids come into a university we do extensive testing. Mm -hmm. We work really hard. The county does a good job. The city does a good job. Masking is part of the culture. There's five patients with COVID in Lawrence Memorial. I mean, that is not being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. That's a place that's done it right, I think. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I was actually there earlier this week um, checking out their, their school of music, which was, um, it, they had very small ensembles practicing and they sounded wonderful. Um, they are using the best evidence that they have available to them to return to some degree of pre-COVID um, musical learning mm -hmm. and performing. And I think to, um, to their credit, they've really employed some great things to do, to do it safely. Um, uh, Dr. Scrumsher from Lawrence Memorial and I, and uh, Lance from, from the Infection Prevention and Control Department had some additional recommendations and they were very open to that um, as they're preparing now for, I mean, they're, they're into their fall semester and they're getting ready for spring enrollment. So I think they've done a, a good job and um, they're gonna take on some additional recommendations. Uh, the student population that I saw uh, throughout the campus uh, really are still continuing to do a really good job wearing their masks. Um, I think they probably have some opportunity from an additional social distancing perspective, but they, they were doing a good job wearing masks. And then um, the volleyball team, I was uh, watching them and they did an exceptional job um, during practice wearing their masks. So I was really impressed with them, their coaching staff all having eye protection on. So. That was All good. Right. Keep up the good work. One All of right. our viewers, too, Sarah, this morning also is talking to this, and she just wanted to add that the kids in the school in that area are on distant learning. Yeah. And so she just wanted to give credit a little bit to that, and she has a lot of questions, but Dr. G uh, Gerard is going to be on soon, so we'll, yeah. we'll tackle this really in depth, Sarah, yeah, yeah. in a few but days. The, I think the importance is that when you do it right, you can keep things under control when you don't. Things are starting to get overwhelmed. And we're seeing that playing out in town after town after town across the state. Across and then the Laura with KCUR is asking, what advice can you give to prospective voters who really want to go to the polls, but they're worried about voting during a pandemic? Yeah. How do we stay yeah. safe? Well, I think that's a great yeah, question. And here's I what I know. That, uh, first of all, if you can do early voting, go do early voting. Mm -hmm. I've already voted. And, uh, and, I, and it was, I felt totally comfortable when I was there. And, and so I would just urge you, uh, I went down to Union Station, did the early voting here in Kansas City and, and uh, for Missouri residents, and, and I thought it was, they did great. And I think that's really the key. The polling places are working hard to make sure that people maintain six feet of distance and, is, and, and, and you have to wear a mask. And so if you're masked and you have the distance, 
think you're really safe and there's hand sanitizer everywhere. Mm -hmm. I had no reluctance about going to vote. I don't think anybody should feel reluctant to go to vote because I think they can keep it safe. I completely agree. I think we've established that there's um, things that you can do. Um, I'm thinking of things like the, the DMV and other things that are, are absolutely necessary. They've been able to stay open and do it safely. Um, if you're worried about, um, and I, I think they're going to have really good crowd control yeah. uh, things in place. So I, I really don't think there's going to be concern. I don't either. And you know, I just, I turn to our hospital, right? I look at what, what's the hottest hot spot in any town, and it's the hospital uh, place where they're taking care of COVID patients. And we have a hot couple of floors here that are dedicated to taking care of COVID patients. With people wearing masks and doing a good job of washing their hands and things, we're not seeing transmission of the virus from patients to employees. So if you're not going to do it there with infection control, you're not going to do it in line in voting. So don't let scare tactics, don't let anybody tell you you can't vote safely. You absolutely can do it. Wear a mask, keep your distance, wash your hands, mm -hmm. and then you can do it. Yeah. yeah. I think if you have any concern about what are those um, safeguards that they have in place, you can call ahead and see what they've done, and I'm sure they'd be happy to explain yeah. to you so that you can have a little bit more confidence going in. But I think if you're masked and you maintain your distance, wash your hands, you should be just fine. Yeah, yeah. I think more concerning is um, everybody needs to get out and vote. Uh, you can be safe, wear a mask, distance, wear eye protection or a face shield, goggles or a face shield. I would be more concerned about my vote not counting, especially on the mail, um, whether it's not done correctly. Mm -hmm. um, some states have rules where unless it's a close election, those mail-in ba ballots aren't even counted. So it's, I think it is very important to go in person to vote. Your vote will then be counted. There are just so many variables with the other uh, mail and voting and things of that nature. So it is important, and you can be safe if you do those things that we were talking yep. about. Republican, Democrat, Independent, yep. Martian, I don't care. Right. Make your foot, make Jedi. yourself get voted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jedi Knight, that's yeah. right. Or, or wait, can I just say <laughs> Trekkie? Because last <laughs> night Star Trek Discovery opened and it was fantastic. And so, yes, you can stay safe watching Star Trek Discovery. You can stay safe voting. All right. Ready to go into some of the questions? I think we're ready. To, I think we're locked and loaded. Let's do Let's this. Let's do it. Let's All do right. the community. And before I go to this first one, we've got to address this. Bailey read an article in the Kansas City Star this morning that said hospitals are bursting at the seams. And she says that is inconsistent with what you're saying at KU. Yep, you bet. Let's talk about that because I was going to get to that very point anyway because I saw that article. And, mm -hmm. and I do know, you know, we have that um, regular chief medical officer uh, phone call and we do go around the horn <laughs> and, and we know kind of what's going on with each other. Um, we are, we're, we're very busy. We're pretty full at KU, but it's not just COVID. It's everything. Um, and, and I think it's a kind of, so let's talk a little bit about that. We'll, we'll pull those numbers apart a little bit and you guys will help yeah. me keep me on track here. The, um, you know, we normally have around 800 beds here. Uh, 80 of those beds are in semi-private rooms. We converted those to private, so that's a loss of 45 beds. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, we have 26 or whatever the COVID number was today, and about mm -hmm. the, so let's say it's around 55 or 60 patients. So if you say we lost 45 beds to convert, and then we've added a new disease that's taken up 60 beds, that's a lot, that's a shift of about 100 beds. Mm -hmm. That's the stress. Um, along with, we just have a lot of folks to take yeah. care of. And, and so mm -hmm. think about it, by far the overwhelming majority of the patients we're taking care of don't have COVID. And, um, the, and, and that, that's just normal routine care. And we're heading into the busiest season of the year, which is why we think it's so important for people to wear a mask. It's not just about COVID. It's about influenza, rhinovirus, all those things. Wearing a mask, keeping your distance, washing your hands, protect you against all those viruses and not just COVID. So the reality is that if you'll do that, it'll help keep hospitals open so we can take care of folks. Mm -hmm. Now, are hospitals more full? They're always more full this time of the year. That's not a surprise. COVID just pushes it a little higher. What I would say is that I don't think anybody is getting denied care. And we haven't slowed down elective surgeries in the Kansas City area, at least not yet. And we hope we don't have to do that. We have all sorts of plans trying to mitigate that so we don't have to slow down elective surgeries. Because what we know is that really there aren't that many truly elective surgeries. There's some that aren't emergent. And by delaying that care, people are sometimes in pain because they can't get their hip replacement or they delay their cancer surgery care. And we don't want to see that happen because that's not the right outcome. In fact, there was data that came out this week with some studies saying, look, as a result of the pandemic, people delay getting mammograms and that's leading to worse breast cancer diagnoses. So 
That is not the outcome we want. So I think that, yes, there was an article in the Star yesterday about St. Luke's Health System having a shortage of beds. It was quoting some of the folks who are or one of the persons who was, I think, is an ER doc there and also part of the St. Luke's uh, pandemic advisory team. We all need to be thoughtful about that. We are still taking care of everybody. I think St. Luke's is still taking care of everybody. I think all of our hospitals in Kansas City are still taking care of folks. We do know that in Pittsburgh, Kansas, because um, they had a, lar a stronger surge there of COVID patients, and I believe the number was their hospital inpatient census is up to about 25 COVID patients out of 61 beds, which is a big number. Mm -hmm. It's a big percentage. They did put a halt to mm -hmm. elective surgeries, and that happened yesterday. And that's where we don't want to find ourselves. And the way we can avoid that is to make sure we wear a mask, keep our distance, and wash your hands, and don't go out if you're sick. I, so. I think one thing to add is that we do have um, systems in place, and you can probably speak to this um, as well, that whenever hospitals are concerned about their capacity, they work with other community hospitals to make sure that we can provide um, care to those that need it. Yeah, and we actually have a whole um, team of people, Dana, who are mm -hmm. especially geared at that with the ICU level. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we are working towards, um, we do have those systems in place. We meet every week or two um, with the ICU. The ICU director is just kind of assessing where everybody is at. The other thing to note that not so much here in the city, but in rural areas too, the ability to staff the beds by nursing is a, an important prospect as well. So when you have workforce shortages because of quarantine or other illness, that doesn't allow you to have uh, those beds staffed by nursing, so that can add to the crunch as well. So we have work, we do work with um, other ICUs around uh, the city. Um, we, again, uh, meet every week or every two weeks. We'll continue to do that and make sure that we have capacity and uh, coordinate as a team as we need to. Yeah, it's, it's really important. And I think the community has, i just be honest, I think the community's done a great job pulling mm -hmm. together and working mm -hmm. together. Yeah. And, and um, just the hats off to all of the folks who are on, the, the chief medical officers and the teams that are on those calls we do every week on the ICU side, the, the chief medical officer side, the administrative side. I think the city, you can say you should be proud because mm -hmm. people have worked really well together and it's been great. There are good, good, good hospitals all around the city. All right, let's get to some of these questions. First one is, there are news reports of young people intentionally trying to get COVID-19, believing herd immunity will protect them and to sell their plasma to help others. Does this sound thinking? Well, the answer to this question is no. It is not sound thinking. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to really, it, this is like Russian roulette, and, and there are better ways to make money than to sell your own plasma after you get COVID-19. And remember this. If the immunity lasts four to six months, which is kind of what we think it is, which would be consistent with other coronaviruses, then the reality is you have to go get it every six months. Well, mm -hmm. that's a terrible idea because you're really playing with a loaded gun every six months. And just because you're young, stop thinking that you're invincible. And remember, it's not just about death. It's also about the injuries that you can incur. Because even though you may not hear about this as much, there are people who are going to have long-term pulmonary problems and shortness of breath because they did have COVID-19, or long-term heart disease, or neurological impairments from memory loss. COVID-19 can be a mild illness. But unlike coronavirus, the normal coronavirus or rhinovirus, those things, that's a mild illness. COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2, Russian roulette. Don't do that. Yeah, in fact, um, you know, herd immunity is a very dangerous prospect. Uh, the best... Yeah, because when you do it, you're going to overwhelm everybody because you're not just going to keep it amongst the young people because if you try and do that, right. it's going to spread to older yeah. folks. It's not going to just stay in that demographic, in your demographic. In addition, if you're doing it to sell your plasma, well, there is very good evidence to suggest that if you have mild or no symptoms, you may not even mount enough antibodies to donate plasma to even be helpful to anybody getting that plasma in general. So uh, overall, the answer is no, that's a horrible idea. Um, in getting to herd immunity, if that is even possible, there would be so much uh, destruction and uh, suffering compared to what we have now if we were able to get to that 90 percent amount of infection, which is the traditional sense of herd immunity. Yeah, we need a vaccine to do that. Otherwise, yeah. what's going to happen is we'll get the herd, herd immunity and that's just going to come up. That's going to ca cause everything to come crashing down. So that that's just a terrible idea. And there's more and more um, reports every day of 
reinfection mm -hmm. within three or four months of the original infection. As yeah, well, you want to so. shutter all the businesses, go into yeah. sheltering in place, close all the schools, go try to do her. We don't community. want that. That's just a bad thought. Okay, next. We've talked masks pretty well, so we're going to go to testing right now. How does one get a test? If, I, if they have no symptoms and they're not being screened for a medical procedure. Amanda, can we get it done? Um, I don't know that you can get yeah. it done. We have such a um, short uh, capacity limitations um, that we really need to be reserving those for folks who have been potentially exposed and who are demonstrating symptoms. I would, I would hate to run out of mm -hmm. uh, a supply just um, because we're curious. You can't do it just because of that. But the, the other, but then the other side of this is we do have some tests that are not getting used in this state and now there's a new problem emerging. People don't want to be positive or get a test and know they have to quarantine. Mm -hmm. So Dana, that's also a bad idea, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I would almost say get your test. That way it's only 10 days rather than a 14 day quarantine. So I think that's mm -hmm. important. The CDC certainly has recommended testing for close contacts. We just haven't really landed on when exactly to test. I would not test one to two days after exposure. I wouldn't test before say five to eight days. Um, at so least. Because really, least, we, we yeah. know, I mean, I just had a patient who became positive at 12 days after their exposure. Wow. It was a pretty clear exposure, yeah. which is, okay, well, that's, how, that's, how, that's what the statistics say is going right. to happen. Mm -hmm. So let's not do that. That's also not a great right. thought. And I think what people are trying to do is figure out how to live more normally with both of these first mm -hmm. two questions. The answer is you live more normally, and it doesn't feel normal, I get it, but you do live more normally mm -hmm. if you can get through this. And there is hope on the way. You know, Pfizer just announced they're hoping by the end of November that they're going to submit an EUA for a vaccine, which is an early use authorization, yeah. providing, quote, the data looks positive. I don't think Pfizer would have said that if they didn't have an interim analysis that suggests that they're, that they're yeah. hopeful about their data. Yeah, absolutely. And we already are working with um, our health system state government to really be able to uh, get those vaccines and give the vaccination um, as soon as they are available. Uh, in addition, we are also working with um, if there are EUAs for outpatient antibody treatments as well. So we're already trying to be ahead of the curve, a step ahead of where we think it's going to be. And once those things are available, be ready to, to give them. All right, here's opportunity for show and tell. How much hand sanitizer is needed for protection? A couple of sprays or cover the whole hand? Do you guys want to demonstrate how you do it? Go, Gardner, so, let's do it. And, you know, this is, um, is it one pump? Is it a half pump? Is it a whole pump? You just want to make sure that your entire body, uh, surface area of your hands are Did covered. Did you say your entire body is covered? I did, your body, I, <laughs> thank you for calling it out. No, um, the surface area of your hands. You. Um, so if, if one pump isn't enough, um, or if you don't need a full pump, depending on the size of your hand, you just want to make sure you get all surfaces um, completely covered and you want to wait until they're dry before you start touching anything else. <laughs> All right, well done. great. And what happens if you want to do it to your entire body? How does that work? I don't I don't recommend that. That's, okay. called, that's called spring break. <laughs> Hawkeye, really? <laughs> or honeymoon, uh, I don't know. Friday. It is clearly <laughs> Friday. It is. It we is. all need Friday it. Yeah, okay. All right, next question is mask wearing is minimal at my gym. Is it still safe if we physically distance? And a viewer added on here, they're concerned. They want you to speak to mask hygiene because she thinks a lot of people are using their same mask over and over and not washing it, not throwing it away. Okay, well, let's take on the first part of the question. Yeah. The answer to this is no, especially if you're inside because you breathe harder, so you're going to express more viral particles. And most gyms, and now in fairness, some gyms, very tall ceilings, one or two people in them, mm -hmm. lots of physical distance, I'll give that to you. You go into a crowded gym and people aren't wearing masks, they're breathing hard, and all of a sudden that changes. Those breath clouds are all hanging out unless you know that, that room turnover rate's really fast, Amanda. Yeah, I think this kind of goes back to that uh, Swiss cheese model. So if you are in an area where you are close proximity, you've added more holes to that layer of cheese. If you know that not everyone's wearing a mask, you have more holes in that layer of cheese. And so as you add more risk of people closer to you not wearing a mask, you increase that likelihood or that risk of you um, getting the disease. So I think to whatever degree you can control, if you, like, like you mentioned, if you're in a gym, a large gym where you're able to truly maintain, and if somebody's not wearing a mask, I'm saying you need to be 12 feet or further away from them, especially during those kinds of activities. Um, it's, 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 I think it's still high risk. Yeah. I would do what I could to communicate to the, the gym leadership of mandating masks in that setting to, to the degree mm -hmm. possible. And then again, just trying to maintain as much distance as possible. But if, yeah. if you can't maintain the distance, then pick a different um, piece of equipment to work out with. Yeah, I think it, it is very dangerous. Uh, you know, when I go to my gym, they do have good protocols in place. Um, they do have spacing markers as well. 
Um, again, it's not doing the treadmill or the elliptical or the classes, it's just kind of weight work. But I do wear the mask, some people do not. Um, we even know that there's a good uh, case report of a, I think it was a, uh, a spin studio, which the health department came in and said everything is being done correctly and to the T but yet they still had 61 cases of COVID diagnosed. So even with those protocols, just be careful. I uh, would certainly recommend wearing a mask while doing it. It is obviously difficult if you're doing the elliptical or something aerobic like that, but maybe you need to do that outside. Um, but it is important to be wearing a mask when doing that. And the that. answer is, these are just gonna be hard things because the yep. answers are not what people wanna hear. Right. And by the way, that word gym could have been restaurant, it could have been grocery store, it could have been a lot of different things. And, and so the reality is when you don't wear a mask, you spread more disease. It's really simple. Mm -hmm. And um, the, unfortunately, again, we don't wanna hear that answer, but that really is the right answer. And so for gymnasiums, unfortunately, people are breathing harder. And we know mm -hmm. when you breathe harder, the distance that you have to go and separate is not just six feet, it gets to 10, mm -hmm. 12, 20 feet. And, and that becomes the new number. And then if the breath clouds are all hanging out in the air because the room isn't well ventilated, mm -hmm. then you get into even more trouble. So there are so many variables in this. The yeah. space, the height of the ceiling, how many people are in there, are they wearing masks, and how what, how good the ventilation is. And there's also a lot of surfaces in there, so there a are. lot of That's areas right. that can potentially get contaminated. And as you asked, um, or the add-on question was the mask hygiene. Um, if you are wearing a mask and you are doing an activity where you're moving around, the likelihood of that mask staying in place is pretty low. So you're going to have to adjust it, which means you now have contaminated your hands and you may not think before you go and pick up the next set of dumbbells to wash your hands or to wipe them off. So I think there is um, just additional risks associated with that. Um, in regards to wearing the same mask over and over and over, um, the recommendation, especially if you have a cloth mask, is that you're washing it every day. Um, and then uh, for those that are using surgical masks, uh, whenever they become visibly soiled or whenever they become wet, you really should be disposing of them. All right. Next question. What do you think about church hosted community Thanksgiving dinners during a pandemic? Also a bad idea. Yeah. It's the same problem, right? The problem for most churches is unless they're going to have all the same rules that we're saying to a restaurant, wear a mask, be distanced, only have your bubble at the table. The more you mix up the tables, the more things are not going to work. And I think that's the problem. And unfortunately, like our church, we, we haven't been back in together since the beginning of the pandemic. And we had this really big Thanksgiving meal and it was awesome. And it was done usually the, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And, and uh, we're not doing it this year because you just can't figure out how to do that safely when you put a lot of people into a contained area. And, and, and so the, the, the story for a church Thanksgiving dinner is really the exact same as what you would say to a restaurant with people dining indoors. Probably 25% capacity, you have to maintain, the people have to be six feet apart, not just the tables have to be six feet apart. And you know, I would say that's at a minimum. And you gotta have folks wear their mask unless they're eating. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing that sometimes you see in restaurants, people go into the restaurant, like, I'm in a restaurant, I can take my mask off. No. Keep your mask on mm -hmm. till you sat down. You take a drink of, of wine or water or whatever, put your mask back on. And then when your food arrives, you take your mask off, you eat, and then you put your mask back on. What you see is you're like, I'm in a restaurant, free license. Mm -hmm. I don't have to wear a mask. Coronavirus magically does not spread in a, in a restaurant. No, that's actually not true. I think this um, extends beyond just the church hosted. I think this is really any hosted Thanksgiving. Whenever you're talking about bringing extended family members or friends into your home, we have to be cautious there too. Um, you're introducing people who are not in your bubble um, to the table, which is also a highly vulnerable situation. And most tables aren't six feet across, so you exactly. aren't socially distant. You have your mask off and you're dealing with folks that you haven't been living with or, or included in your bubble. So I think. I think Thanksgiving itself is um, a, a high-risk activity. It is, and it's yeah. like the greatest holiday. You know, maybe I know. One of my, it may be my favorite holiday. Yeah. I would say that the, in the church setting or, or the home or um, you know a, a living facility, you're probably going to have a higher proportion of more at-risk individuals too, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. I think that's true. What you just said is a good segue into the next mm -hmm. part. If everyone in our extended family outside of our bubble quarantined for 14 days before Thanksgiving, are we safe to eat together? I, it makes me feel better that they've done that. What do you think? Amanda? Yeah, I think there's um, benefit of doing that because if you've truly quarantined yourself, you've yeah. prevented your likelihood of being um, exposed or being asymptomatic and potentially um, transmitting it to your family. Um, I know there was a question about 
doing that 14 days before then getting on a plane or um, traveling out of That's state. actually the next oh, question, well, um, which and is I, good, bring it up. I think the, the airport itself is then that potential introduction mm -hmm. to if you've done a great job of quarantining yeah. for 14 days, you have to be so cautious of um, the airport because that's obviously introducing yourself to a lot of folks outside of your bubble, um, being in an airplane for a, an extended amount of time. Um, and I know we've talked about this over and over, wearing the mask, eye protection being a good idea when you're on an airplane. But I, I, I think 14 days quarantining before Thanksgiving is probably a, a, mm -hmm. a better idea, but I don't think it's... 100% guaranteeing that yeah. there's no risk. Yeah, yeah. airplanes bug me. I, I'm not so bad. At, I'm traveling in a car, I drive, and I think I'm okay with that, but uh, the airplane thing. Yeah, you know, go, to the quarantine, if it is a strict quarantine, just as you said, how, how well is it done? If you're flying, again, nothing is 100% um, risk-free, but certainly flying is more risk than driving. But if you can, maintain good hand hygiene. Keep your distance while in the airport, while waiting to get on the plane. Uh, wear your mask. You probably even want to wear your goggles while in the airport as well. The, you're doing all of these little steps to reduce that risk as much as possible to get to where you want to go and keep those other loved ones safe. Okay, we've kept this up because um, there's the part about going from Missouri to Kansas to visit 84-year-old auntie. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is the one about the flying and, yeah. and if I right. quarantine, should I get there? Because this is from Missouri to Florida to visit my 84-year-old yeah. aunt. So should I quarantine for 14 days upon arrival to Florida? What do you guys think? Is it upon arrival or after arrival? Uh, upon or arrival. Once they, once they flew, flew from Missouri to Florida, should they quarantine for 14 days once they get to Florida after they've flown? Uh, I would say, well, I, definitely I would quarantine for 14 days prior. Make it strict. Make sure that you really haven't had contact with other people uh, before you go to see that at-risk individual. Um, you know, once once you get there, I don't know that you really have to quarantine. Um, I think, so I think the sure question is flying are. enough of a risk factor that you should quarantine once you get mm -hmm. there. And I, I mean, I think that we have seen that people can fly safely. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's, in my mind, I think it's an unknown because you don't know, um, depending on what the airline um, recommendations are, you might be within six feet of somebody. Yeah. Um, you know, just not having the middle seat isn't six feet, and then you've got people in front of you and behind you, and depending on um, the crowd control that they have when you're standing in line. Um, I haven't been on an airplane, so I don't know if those, um, like as you're getting on and getting off, if they have truly allowed for appropriate mm -hmm. social distancing. So you have that inter of a new risk that you're not used to, whether you're quarantining strictly for 14 days prior to getting on the airplane, I think the airport mm -hmm. airplane experience is a risk. Um, I probably would say 14 days after the airplane is, I mean, that's what we were doing before whenever we were doing travel related um, quarantine, but it may be over the top. Yeah, I think there's, it, this is just one of those hard questions you have to ask, well, what's your own personal risk tolerance? Yeah. What's the risk tolerance of your 84-year-old aunt in this one? And what are the public health rules when you get there? Because there are some areas where they want you to quarantine mm -hmm. because we come from a pretty high area. And you may go to an area in New England, for example. Yeah. I know Maine for a while, uh, as my wife was going to go up there, and she's like, I can't go because I have to quarantine for 14 days upon arrival. Mm -hmm. And they, they're, they're pretty strict. Mm -hmm. And so you make sure you know what the rules are. Now, Missouri and Florida both have very high rates of mm -hmm. transmission, so I don't know that that's as much of an issue. But... I, that an aunt has got some compromised health, the safer you approach it, the better off you're going to be and the better off your aunt will be. I do think you can, by and large, be safe mm -hmm. flying an airplane. It's always safer to drive, in my opinion. Yeah, I think um, it's about a three-hour flight probably to <clears throat> most places in Florida. So if you can do all those little measures, again, it, it's kind of synergistic or additive. Do those, maintain those strict measures with the masking, the hand hygiene, uh, the physical distancing as much as possible. That will reduce your risk as much as possible. All right. My husband works out of town, and when he returns, mm -hmm. should we wear masks around each other? And if so, for how long? That's another hard one. Yeah, All right, I Hawk, know. what do you think? Um, you know, certainly masking in the household has, has shown to be um, beneficial as far as reducing spread. I guess it depends uh, where the work was, what was the nature of uh, all of those interactions, because now you're including other people who are not normally inside your bubble, um, it's not a bad thing to consider. Um, but I think, again, knowing all of those other details um, is very important to do. 
Yeah, I completely agree. And you've talked about this before whenever you talk about can you travel safely, period. Mm -hmm. It's really not about where you're going. It's about what are you doing and yep. are those um, pillars of infection control going with you? Yes, they so travel. So if your husband's working out of town but he is maintaining social distancing, he's not in close contact with a bunch of other people, he's always wearing a mask, um, doing good hand hygiene, that level of risk really doesn't change whether he's geographically near or far away from you. Um, it's just a matter of what are those activities that he's partaking in. Totally agree. I think if people work hard at it, they can stay safe. Vicki, I want to tag on her question to the next one that we have uh, about news reports of emerging therapies. Mm -hmm. Will patients here mm -hmm. get access through FDA compassionate use? Vicki also wants you to comment on a WHO report that remdesivir doesn't help yeah. COVID patients. Let's take on both of those things because, yeah. um, first of all, we know that with remdesivir, we've got U.S.-based studies so in randomized trials that do show it helps. The, I'm not sure about the World Health Organization yeah. studies, so I know you just talked about that a little mm -hmm. while ago to our medical yeah. staff. Let's take that on. Um, you know, we'd like to say that the World Health Organization said hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. Lopinavir, ritonavir doesn't work, interferon doesn't work. Also, remdesivir didn't really have any benefit towards mortality, um, getting out of the hospital as well. Um, that is uh, a little bit different than some of the randomized controlled trials here. It's not going to change anything we're doing here right now. I think it's, it's very interesting. Interesting. We'll still continue to evaluate our therapeutics group here. We'll still continue to evaluate all the available data. It is um, still recommended for hospitalized patients, so we will take that all into consideration. Uh, but again, I don't know the other confounding factors of those studies. Were they using dexamethasone on those ill patients? Were they using anticoagulation on those uh, patients? Was convalescent plasma used? So there are a lot of confounding factors that when I read through that report, um, which was very well done, I didn't see a lot of that information, but that was just an early perusal today. So it's not going to change anything we're doing today. Uh, in addition to the other uh, drugs that were mentioned, the RLF100 and the um, Curvaza, I believe. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what that one is, the RLF100. Regeneron, 100. I think. The what is I the think Regeneron? Regeneron calls their drug. Okay. Can, can you so the Regeneron one, we are putting systems and protocols in place if there is an EUA, an emergency use authorization for outpatient use of the um, monoclonal antibody cocktails. We are starting already to work with pharmacy, our infusion centers, um, our administration to have those, those protocols in place should that become available. The RLF 100 is a, uh, the vasoactive intestinal peptide. We are not using that one specifically, but we are in a trial with a similar product. Um, that's uh, led by Dr. Leslie Spikes here. Um, we have completed enrollment for that, so we are looking at that. And as far as whenever there are emergency use um, authorizations or compassionate use um, uh, recommendations, we continue to have our therapeutics group that meets every week, that continues to stay up on all of the um, most updated recommendations. So we will continue to evaluate those and use those when they're available. And I, I know I just say, I think we are studying these things on an ongoing and yeah. regular basis. And I think the other big news is that uh, Pfizer announced, uh, I think late yesterday, early this morning, that they're going, they hope to apply for early use authorization with their vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, that they would go for EUA in late November, which would say that it would be ready for distribution potentially under um, a, an EUA as early as this is some time point in December. So um, that, that's, I think that's big news. Uh, they, they say we got to make sure it's, it's it's going to work, et cetera. But that companies don't say that unless they have some inkling that things are going pretty well. And, yeah. and I think that 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 so that's probably good news for the rest of us. And so, I think that and the monoclonal antibodies are both game changers. You know, when you when you look and you're in the midst of this type of a crisis, you try to find a little hope, right? We all want to find a little hope, or we just rebel and we don't wear a mask. Don't do that, mm -hmm. because hope does abound, and 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 hope is there and it's available to us. You see it every time you watch people wear masks. You you see it when people can do things together and do it safely. You see it when you do something right. I think you know we we talked earlier about the University of Kansas uh, opening up successfully and and keeping people safe and the. Douglas County and Lawrence and the Lawrence Memorial doing a great job of keeping the county and the people there safe. And I think, you know, that to me that says hope. And what we have to look for in the midst of the pandemic is hope, and we can find it in many places. And I think hope is coming medically as well. We know that people today with the, the cocktail of therapy that we use in a hospital have a 8% mortality rate. We're originally in the crisis, that was around 30 or 40%. Mm -hmm. yeah. Clearly things are better now than yeah. they were, and I think they're gonna get a lot better over the next few months. We have one last paper question. 
and then I would like you to speak to it. Got a lot of people that are having anxiety okay. over fear. Let's do so, it. the last question that we have graphically is: What do you think of two new studies, one Danish and one Canadian, showing typo blood may lower the risk of COVID nineteen? Yeah. What do you think, Hawk? I'm um, a negative, so be careful what you say here. <laughs> a negative is the worst. I know it is. <laughs> I saw that. I mean, it's the best, <laughs> yeah. boss. It's yeah. the best. Yeah, there you it's go, the brother. <laughs> no, I think, um, you know, I think these are all interesting findings. There are conflicting reports. We know that from the first big one that was touted, um, that the same number of people were hospitalized and needing supplemental oxygen, to, and it didn't matter, it didn't matter what type of blood type they had. Um, in that analysis, there was more severe, I think, in the type O or, or was it the type A. Um, this is another study. I think it's all very interesting. I think in terms of genetics, there is still a lot to learn. It's not going to change anything we do clinically. It shouldn't change anything you do as an individual or your family to help reduce the risk of spread of the disease, and that is masking and distancing. It's all very interesting findings. It's still very new. We are you know, using these genomic studies now on a, on a new basis that we haven't really used those before, and we are using it. Again, we are still trying to build this plane while we're flying it. So it's interesting uh, studies, interesting findings. But clinically, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not going to change anything that we're doing in the hospital, and it shouldn't change anything for the public health guidance either. And then the last and final question is, I think Jeanette sums it up for a lot of people on there. She's a school bus driver. She mm -hmm. needs to get back to work. Mm -hmm. She is terrified. And she wants to know, short of taking medication, mm -hmm. what can you say going into the weekend that might help folks? You know, here's what I would say. <clears throat> we know we can stay safe. And we know we see it done every mm -hmm. single day. I still think one of the most remarkable stories is out of Springfield, Missouri, where the two hairstylists, who are both positive, saw 140 clients, everybody had a mask on, and nobody got sick. We see it play out every day in communities which put in stronger mask requirements in place. We see it true, it's true in New York City, one of the most crowded cities on earth. Doing a lot better in Kansas City. We see it up in Maine, we see it in New England. We see it in Lawrence, Kansas. There is hope. And I think the answer to anxiety is hope and trying to make sure you look not just around you, but you look forward. And I think when you look forward, you can see things on the horizon that look much more similar to yesterday than they do to right now. And that's where the hope is, right? That's where hope is. You know, I, I, when you're on this program, you often hear me say, brother, sister. I think what we have to remember is that we're all brothers and sisters in this, right? Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, um, whether you wear a mask or you don't, whether you're a, a Chiefs fan or a Raiders fan, God forbid, whether it's Star Wars or Star Trek, we are brothers and sisters in this. And that means we're together, and what we really need to achieve is to keep each other safe. And when you see people keeping each other safe, that's where hope is. And that's what can ease anxiety. Because all the proof is that when you do that, you're going to be okay. And the second thing is that there are emerging therapies out there mm -hmm. that really look like they're game changers. You know, I go back to the words I heard one person say about the monoclonal antibody study. It wasn't hard to see who know who got the drug. You were blind and didn't know. But the people who are getting the drug, they're calling back the next day, feeling so darn good. There's hope. You know, I worked in the area of CF here. You know, when I started CF, the average survival was like 18 or 19 years of age. And today it's 40-something. And with this new therapy, we're telling people they have to save for retirement. That was never true back when we started at CF. And what we had to do is make sure we stay focused on enjoying every moment that we can out of the day we can while we stay safe, because hope is on the way. Final thoughts from today, Amanda Garner. Um, I think just to add to that, we can't control everything that's going on around us, but what we can control is our own behavior and our own attitude, our own response to it. And so I think we can, um, we know the ways to stay safe and to keep each other safe. So going back to the um, wear your mask, stay socially distanced. Right now is a great time to get your, your flu shot. Um, keep your hands safe. Um, happy Boss's Day. <laughs> yeah. Is today Boss's Day? Yeah. Today's Boss's Day. I had no idea about that. <laughs> Dana? 
Yeah, you know, I think in any high stress um, situation or job, it's important to remember your training and go back to your training. This is not any different. We are trying to uh, arm you with knowledge and, and teach you and train you what to do. Um, that is in those situations, remember to wear your mask, remember to wear your eye protection or your goggles. If you're on a bus, if you can have, you know, open windows, if you can have the fan blowing, um, you know, back towards you, uh, to really create that turbulent airflow. Obviously, when it's colder, it's going to be harder to keep the windows open, but anything to keep that uh, turbulent airflow. And again, pro hopefully the riders on the bus will all have masks as well. And so you really should be safe. Continue to do hand hygiene. Try not to manipulate your mask very much, but doing all those things will lower your risk as much as possible. Um, hopefully reduce your anxiety as well. Hey, on Monday, Johnson County Public Health Officer Dr. Joseph Lamaster and Dr. Jessica Callender-Rich, who is a national member of the Coronavirus Commission for Safety and Quality and a member of a big national nursing home task force, um, is go are going to join to answer questions about the spread of the virus in, in, in Johnson County and what's driving it, what's the impact on public schools and on nursing homes. I think that'll be a great conversation. Hope that you're here to be a part of it with us. Remember to send us your mask photos. We really look forward to seeing how you're using your mask and making that part of your Halloween costume. A couple of great photos from, to, from today. Alice is a stage four cancer center thriver. Her mask reads, relentless champions of hope fight colorectal cancer. Her shirt is a Colorado 14er shirt. She says she was giving a, given a 14% chance of survival for the past five years. She celebrates year number four on Sunday. She writes, my team says I'm a miracle and I'm beating the odds. I'm a 14er wearing my mask to protect others and myself. Way to go, sister. And Joni and John sent this picture of their deck to share with everyone. They're embracing the outdoors for as long as they can and remembering us that it won't all last forever. And they still, they agree that there's still no place like home. And isn't that still the truth? Remember, we're all brothers and sisters. Know your Swiss cheese. <laughs> Make sure you stay safe. We'll see you on Monday. And there really is still no place like home.